Martin's weekend? Good, good, good. I went to a hot sauce festival. Uh, you know, uh, I know, right? Anyways, hopefully uh, you're working hard on uh, problem set two. How, who here has already finished it? Yeah, look at that. Not, not terribly difficult or, you know, maybe you're, you're working on it. Uh, but again, do be mindful. Make sure to kind of spend some time, allocate, to, especially again, while I gave you the pseudocode for the A star, I didn't give you the pseudocode for like finding your way or, you know, making the decision of where to step next. So once you kind of start working on it, you'll see that. That's my kind of little note. Also be mindful you have your lecture exercise due on Wednesday. Please make sure to have that finished. With that out of the way, uh, so I honestly, I, I actually just like love this lecture, um, mostly because never in my life would I have expected me to teach such a five dollar word, five dollar science word, right? Meta heuristics, right? That's just such a, a wild and crazy word. But what is, if you kind of think about what we have been doing for the past two lectures, right? We've introduced this idea that, hey, right, I, I need to be able to evaluate some state, some configuration, some node, you know, in my tree. And the issue that we were kind of getting at, especially this is why we introduced, you know, the notion of A star was, oh, I, what's the word I'm looking for? I need a way to know how much farther I have to go, right? That's the, what the concept of the heuristic is. It's my estimation on how well I can, uh, how good does this lead me to a specific goal or task or something like that. The big fancy $5 word, really, you know, the meta heuristic part of that just kind of ties into the notion that there's more algorithms out there than a star. And that's what we're going to spend, you know, today on. And then when we get to Wednesday, we're going to keep on talking. We're just essentially going to be looking at a number of the traditional algorithms that we use in, a, in artificial intelligence to kind of accomplish tasks, specifically this idea of optimization, right? Think about what we've done so far with most of, well, all of A star, right? A star was this kind of, hey, I, I need to uh, get to Seattle from RDU, or I need to get my, my tile from this, or my robot from this tile to this tile. And even when we were talking about it from uh, the sliding eight, it was like, what action do I do next, right? That was the sliding puzzle. But what about configurations where it's no longer a pathway? It's not like, oh, hey, do a step, then turn, then do a step. It's, there's no physical distance going on there. And so maybe those heuristic functions that we were spending time on last week just aren't going to be worthwhile. Are there other things that we could be working on? And so that's that idea of the configuration. But since I've started to list off problems, Here's a new one for you. So this one is known as the linear assignment problem. There's also a sort of a, a, a cousin to this called the quadratic assignment problem. It just makes it more complicated. But the end of the day is we've got five people or N people, right? We've got a red, orange, green, blue, and indigo. And then I have five tasks. I have the custodian, the cook, the chef, the host, and then the bartender. And the name of the game is to assign each person to a task. Now, when it was just this slide, that was easy, right? You could just arbitrarily pick, or you, you know, red goes to the one right below. That was easy. But what happens, and this is where the linear assignment comes in, what happens when I associate some type of value to some type of assignment. And this is where, hey, you can play this, you know, you pick what you want that number to be. Is it how much it costs? Is it that uh, red as a chef would cost us $14 an hour? Or 
It could be read as a chef is producing us uh, $14 of revenue per hour or whatever, right? That part's not, you know, the, the goal of maximizing or minimizing, that's where you kind of assign it some type of, um, what's the word, some type of actual purpose. But the end game is I have people, I have roles, uh, assign them, right? Pick the configuration that works best for you. But here's the problem, right? Oh, I'll just do a for loop, right? You're, you're programmers, you, you, you know how you could code this away without me giving you any form of an algorithm. Well, you could just do like a, a giant five nested for loop. Don't, please don't do that. Just, yeah, don't, don't do that. Dr. King will cry uh, if you do that. No, yeah, and I mean, okay, I'm showing you a fiver, uh, but that's because I need it to you know, be visible on my screen and to show you. What happens as we start to grow to scale, right? Well, this problem in particular, if you're thinking about all the possible configurations of one person to one task and every task has to be assigned, you're actually seeing a, a, an in factorial. So big O in factorial. So, right, that's that, from the charts that you saw in data structures, that's the one that just spikes immediately. And look at that, right? Yes, for five, it's only 120 configurations. But the second you go to something like 25, the heat death of the universe will happen before you solve this problem or find the optimal configuration. So you cannot do it. And 25 is not a big number, right? So that's actually kind of where I want you to start thinking about today and what we'll start to talk about on Wednesday as well is, well, what happens if I can't do a, a search and maybe knowing the actual answer is impossible or improbable, right? Again, what's the answer to a 25 factorial, you know, what's the optimal configuration? Well, when I say optimal, I mean, like, what's the best of the best? It's impossible for me to figure that out uh, because, again, to do it would require so many, you know, you do the math on, like, if I did a thousand of those a second, right, you still wouldn't, it would still take years to accomplish. So that's kind of where we start to look at the term optimal uh, in different contexts, right? Instead of it being the best, maybe it's the best I can get in a reasonable amount of time, right? That's where we start to kind of look at this because again, we do know that these configurations, they're just like any type of other search. I can evaluate them. I can look at that and say, hey, you know, it will be this desirable. But knowing that end goal, right, the end goal of that top number is too difficult to work off of. So how are we going to tackle these problems? The, you know, this linear assignment problem, this kind of I don't know the goal or the goal is mathematically uh, uh, improbable of calculating. And that's where we're going to show off something known as iterative optimization. And you've kind of seen this before. This is sort of the agile development where you like do a little bit and refine and do a little bit refine. We're going to essentially do the, a very similar thing. We're going, to, everything I taught you, right? The A star tree that I make you, I'm making you do for your lecture exercise, right? The A star that I'm making you build, all that, yeah. Iterative optimization just doesn't have it. No searching, well, I don't want to say no search. No search tree whatsoever. We don't care about where we were. There is G, you know, that G of N stuff, we just, no, throw it out entirely. And so that makes this kind of a little bit more interesting uh, from a, like, perspective of treating this as if it was a search tree, right? Suddenly, this is, uh, I'll, what, I'll call you F prime of N, F prime prime of N. Uh, I'll, why am I making these fancy? X of N, Y of N, Z of N, there, right? They each have their own little, and that's it. That's all I care about. I don't care 
deep wise. I don't, I'm not doing anything outlandish. I'm just going to focus realistically on this portion of that design. Never going to kind of uh, break it down further. So how do I begin? Okay, again, remember, think about the problem. We're dealing with linear assignment. Every person or every uh, uh, entity has to have a role. So how do I start? Well, okay, first option, just randomly assign them. Okay, does that work? Yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, because we're going to change it, right? We're going to, that puts us here. We can always fix that. That's, you know, the optimization part that we can do next. So red is the host, green's the chef, orange is the cook. This is one approach. This is another approach, the identity matrix kind of assignment, right? Where think about it from a for loop perspective. For int i equals zero, i plus plus, right? As you iterate on your i, you just assign. So both of those are going to work. That's your good, like, which one do you do? Which one was faster for you to code, right? Because, again, you're going to be changing it right away. Now, there's probably some reason to do one or the over the other, but, you know, that part's the mincing of words. The more important focal point is evaluating that starting point, right? So for my sake, again, this is going to be something you are going to see a few times, you know, in this class. Uh, just as the warning, you know, I know you're still finishing up your problem set twos, but would you like to guess what Monday is going to look like for you? It will be this. Uh, my point being, okay, so what I'm going to do at, for this kind of problem, this kind of design, all I'm going to say is whatever we assign them when we do the eval, when I come in and say, hey, that F, right? All we're going to do is take every one of the numbers we see, add them up. You can do any other, you know, the math, you know, you can change what this math equation needs to be. That's just what I'm working off of because it makes our lives easier or, you know, makes your lives easier. I want you all to struggle on the actual approach, not the math. Uh, so with that out of the way, right, this is where we start to look at possible solutions, right? Well, what if I just did a random search, right? I go and do 10,000 uh, iterations, right? 10,000 iterations, uh, and you, you all understand or did the whole, you know, for loop, what's the largest number in the array, right? You all could do that in your sleep, hopefully, hopefully, very much hopefully, uh, right? But what's the problem with doing a random search? Unbounded. What does unbounded mean? When you say it could take forever, why do you say it could take forever? You're right. In fact, you might never get what you want. And to prove this point, I would like for you, what's your name again? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah please ask me to give you a random number. Four. Again. Four. Again. Four. 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 Am I saying random numbers? Yeah. You can't prove I wasn't. No one can. Again, that's the problem with random, right? Yes, technically, in application, we know, hey, it, it works. But theoretically, it doesn't, especially when we start going to scale, right? Again, that does not make it a good solution. It will be helpful, but it's a little too chaotic, a little too uh, uh, wild. We need to rein it in a little bit, right? There's why that would kind of suck. So to see this in a little bit better approach, maybe rather than just doing random configurations and random assortments and checking, what if I only change one approach, you know, maybe one configuration? We're, we're dealing with, uh, I'll do blue for this, right? If we look at 
our configuration, right? I had, uh, I don't know, I had a, a red, uh, what colors am I using? Red, orange, green. Red, orange, green, blue, indigo. And arbitrarily, let's just give them task one, task two, task three, task four, task five, right? So what if instead of just doing full on random sort or, or random searching, what if I just say, let's swap just two of them, right? Let's just do a simple swap, right? Suddenly R is now T2, O is T1, G, B, and I, they stay the exact same way. Now that allows us to have that branching factor, right? Think about it again from the idea that we're trying to find, right? This is that, that initial N. I want to be able to swap R with O, uh, R with G, R with B, R with I. Right? Look what that did. That gave me a branching factor of four that I could work off of. Is this the only thing you could do? No. But now I have a search tree, right? Well, okay, then what would I do? I could just do a whole, you know, let's look at every one of the children, right, and find the best one and walk to it, would that work? Yeah, it would, it would. But here, obviously, lies a problem. You can already start to see it uh, with this term we call hill climbing, where, yeah, let me just generate out all my possible children. Let me pick the best one, right? Hey, which one is the best child? And we'll just take that. Because, you know, you see, here's my current state. This is like maybe a, a, a way to represent that evaluation that we are seeing, right? Calculate it. When you make one change, that iteration or that other permutation may be slightly better, slightly worse, whatever, right? And so let's arbitrarily say, again, I want to maximize. So I always want to pick uh, moves that are better, right? They get number go bigger. Right? I want that uh, to always happen. And so what may happen right, is, you know, just to say it, there's the, the reverse for minimizing. Right? So again, I generate out my children. Right? So we see it. Hey, that's exactly what I was doing. Here's me swapping R with O, R with G, R with B, R with I. And what do we do? Well, we map it out. We look exactly at what we see here. Hey, what are the evaluations for all of the new configurations? We got an 05, a 100, a 121, and a 93, right? Well, which one do we obviously pick if we're trying to maximize? 121. Yeah, because again, if I'm trying, if my end goal, if my, my purpose is to get the biggest number, well, here you go. You saw one of your children has the biggest number. Let's go to that. If your goal was to get the smallest number, you'd look at your children and you'd go for the smallest number, right? This all makes sense, you know, but there's something slightly wrong here. We'll see it in a second. So again, let's arbitrarily say uh, I, I select the maximizing one because I just need to pick one to work off of. What that ends up doing, again, Right, if we think about where we're going, that is this version. And it's, I know I'm making the search tree and I just told you there is no search tree, but what's really going to happen is not so much this branching downward, but a shift, right? The variable swap from CS116 uh, is kicking in, right? Suddenly, the configuration changes, and my root node of the search tree becomes the child. Uh, it becomes what we selected. That child that we select—that's our new search. That's our new root. 
And now what do we do? Well, we do it again, right? What's the problem? They're all worse. They're all worse. Every one of my options is worse. So if we're trying to maximize, what do I do? Oh, so you abandon all hope on this approach? Yeah, <laughs> give up. <laughs> no, so obviously this is where the limitation of the hill climbing, let's just always pick the next best move comes in, right? What happens when all of my successors are worse than me? Then what do I do? Well, a way to visualize this, right? Yes, I was showing you uh, where our node was here, which made, oh, big, biggest number you know, and smallest number I will obviously get. But what happens if you're not there because you did the identity matrix or you did the random configuration to start? And what ended up happening, you're on this line. Well, again, if we're thinking about this from hill climbing perspective, I'm not going to go down because going down is bad. That, that's a lower number. I'll go up. Right? I'll, I'll always go up uh, because that's going to get me to the better state. But then what happens if I find myself in a situation where no move is better? And what we do is we actually call this the local maxima. We are now stuck in something known as the local maxima. And by the way, that doesn't go away. You will always be suffering whatever algorithm you pick uh, especially when we're trying to go to scale and we have these mathematically impossible num or improbable numbers of calculation, you will always have to suffer with the fact that you're, you theoretically may be stuck in the local maxima. Because that global maxima, right? Remember what we were talking about, 25 factorial, such a big number, heat death of the universe would have to happen before you found the best configuration, the number one configuration. So it's impossible to know if you ever have reached it, right? Well, again, we're stuck in this local maxima where every move is worse than what we currently have. And there are physically no better moves. So what do we do, right? I'm stuck in these local maximas, uh, but I know I'm kind of drawing it at this little level what happens if it had been here, where it's not even remotely close to that global maxima? Right? That's where I want you to kind of start to think about these things. It's like, hey, I can't just you know, pick the biggest one or pick the best looking one immediately. Because again, we have all these terms. You don't have to remember them. Uh, for any form of a test, you just have to be familiar with them, like the local maxima, local minima, global versions of that. Too. Like you have to have them in your, your little repository. But what we want to kind of deal with is the fact that I cannot find every configuration. And that is just something I have to accept about some of our problems, especially as we try to make these real problems, right? I cannot physically find all the configurations, because that is just too big of a number to be working off of. So what I'm going to present to you now is let's just add a little chaos to things, a little random, right? What if, sure, if I find a better move, I'll take it. But if I find a bad move, what if suddenly this was a bad move? Do I take it? It landed on a one. I'll say yes. We'll say, you know, if you land on a one, you take. Is that always the case? Well, no, right? That's the purpose of random. I'm going to need that back. It's on, it was not a one. It was not a one. Is that a question or a? Five, yeah, right? So sometimes I do take this bad move. Sometimes I do not take this bad move. And it depends on, you know, again, which one you're doing, minning or maxing. But again, good move, take. Bad move, sometimes take. 
And that's what metaheuristics are, is now, right, again, I'm just focusing here. Given a list of my possible children and deciding, should I take the path? And again, sometimes I take it, right? That's, that's sort of this kind of approach. Why do we do this is because what we start to see is uh, this is actually pretty straightforward. These are some of our uh, uh, more easy to explain algorithms that don't even rely any calculus or any of that. Like, it's just, it's a formula, it's an approach, it's just a methodology that we can work off of, and they come from uh, things that we as humans have seen and observed out there in nature. Case in point, they actually have their own, you know, metaheuristics, that big fancy $5 word. That really boils down to just what we've seen in nature. Another big fancy way of describing it, biologically inspired algorithms, right? Oh, hey, I've seen this thing in nature. Nature, right? I've seen this approach in physics. I'm going to build a, an optimization algorithm that's based on physics or on the theory of evolution or on literally ants and how ants behave or how whales behave or how people behave. And this isn't the whole, you know, this is just a this is me kind of giving you enough to cover my point, but right, we can do all of these, and that's that is what a meta heuristic is. Is it's just this fancy five dollar word for biologically inspired algorithms, right? Uh -huh. And so that's where we're going to introduce the first of these. We're going to spend again this class, next class, going over all of the ones that you just saw, and this is where I like to have a little fun because there's always one. Or maybe there's always one, right? It's a toss-up. Who here has ever dabbled in, like, blacksmithing or metallurgy? No one? Okay, fine. Hey, you know what? Someone in my other class did. There's always, like, you know, the one person. I'd tell you you got to make friends with them, but you... There you go, right? Raise your hand. What's your name? Caitlin, make friends with Caitlin because Caitlin has good taste in friends, <laughs> right? No, so the big idea, right, is that we're dealing with metallurgy. Well, all right, if we think about metallurgy for a second, <laughs> what is metal made of? Yes. What is that made of? Atoms, molecules, things that are just floating in space. Now, I know you didn't realize this was a chemistry class. What happens when you heat up atoms? They vibrate. They vibrate, they move, they bounce around, they move very erratically, right? And again, think about this. This is what happens with, like, again, with blacksmithing, metallurgy, right? As we heat up metal, it becomes more malleable to work with. I can hit it, and it will bend because these have become so erratic that they are volatile, and I can manipulate them. That's the key word there, manipulate them. Now... Right? What happens when you're done hitting a sheet of metal with a hammer and it's very hot? What do you do next? You quench it, right? You, you, pour, you pour it. You dump it in water. You are going to rapidly decrease that temperature. Why? Because once the temperature goes down, what happens to that erratic behavior. Oh, it slows down. In fact, this is where in metallurgy, it has a term, crystallization. Y'all remember Breaking Bad, right? Y'all remember that Walter White was quite popular with the drugs? 
Specifically, if you, you are a huge nerd for the show, his specialty was in crystallization. So he's getting his meth really hot, and then he quelched it enough to make it crystallize. And that's why you all should watch Breaking Bad, right? Now, we're about to do the same thing. <laughs> I know, I set that up for you perfect. No, that's exactly what simulated annealing is, right? It's this idea that we're going to heat the, up our configuration and let it be volatile because that volatility is our random, right? And then we are going to decrease the temperature because we want it to eventually crystallize and give us that good meth, right? So, blah, blah, blah. so how do I do that? Well, again, we're looking at this from a configuration standpoint. This configuration, right, has its own, that's dying, has its own value, right? It has its own eval n to it. Now, the other issue, though, is specifically well, where are that? We can call this essentially, you know, I'm going to call this my current. That's my current configuration. That's what I've got going on there. Now, I need to also identify my next configuration. And specifically, when I say my next, it's randomly selected, right? Which one of these do I pick? Because I, again, you notice I haven't calculated a number. I haven't presented a number. Which one of these do I pick? I'm going to assume it says two. It does. <sighs> Hold on. They need... Look at that camera. Meet me in Vegas. My point being, I need to evaluate, hey, that other node and we'll call that my next. And what this produces, and this is where we, we just have to add a little bit of terminology because we're, again, working off of a physics-based approach. So that produces, you know, this eval, this everything that we're doing. We calculate and use the term energy. And when we're looking to decide if this is a good move or a bad move, the next thing I need to produce is something called Delta E, the difference in energy, right? What's the difference in energy between these two configurations, right? Uh, that's going to produce, again, next minus current. Let me make that next a little thicker. There we are. And what we do is once we've randomly selected our next option, and we've done our calculation, we're going to get a value back, right? This is a numerical value. Herein lies the fork in the road. How do I determine if it's good? Well, if it's good, then I should have a positive number, right? This delta should be positive because my next move is a better move. Well, if it is a positive move, if it is a step in the right direction, the probability of you know, taking this move is one. I would 100% take a better move. Right? Again, that's climbing up the hill. But what happens? I'll change colors for this. Let me do green. What if instead? I had picked indigo, and I had picked something that was less than zero, right? It was a worse move. Then what do I have to do? Well, again, it's not that I say, oh, let's throw it away. No, we added the element of chaos. We added the element of randomness to our algorithm. And so what we're going to do is say, hey, it's going to depend on how hot the algorithm is. How hot is my metal right now? And it's going to be proportional to that. So to see this in kind of action, right, 
Uh, here's how we, I'll, I'll, you know, there's a temperature. We'll, we'll talk about these things, right? Come on, and there's a swap for minima. Okay, right? Here's the pseudo. I got to pick a different order for these, right? We'll get to the, yeah, okay, fine, fine, right? So if we're looking at this approach, right, hey, E to the delta E over T. Okay, fine, right? Let's see that in action, right? Import M. Okay, uh, we'll call it delta E. We'll say that is negative 15 or negative 10. Why not? Just some arbitrary bad move is what I'm trying to present to it. And my T is going to be 100, just hot, right? Okay. Well, math.e raised to the power of uh, uh, where delta e over t, right? For those, that's, mm -hmm. if you're unfamiliar with Python, the double asterisk is a way you can do exponentials, right? So I, I put this in, and it produces a number. But you notice how, as I was working through this, Temperature needs to gradually start to decline. That's, that's sort of where I'm kind of getting at this with my, for I in range, or sorry, T to zero, we'll go uh, print T, or not T, I, because I is going to be the thing, and then M astra, or M dot E, delta E, over T, or over I, over I, okay, right? So what I'm about to show you is just, hey, that same configuration, that same negative 10, right? Well, if temperature was 100, I produced a 90% probability right, of going to that bad move. As temperature decreases, remember, crystallization's kicking in, molecules stop moving. And if I looked at this in a little bit more detail, sure, at 100 degrees, it has a probability of 90, moving to that move. But what happens if we get down to 50 degrees? Oh, that probability shifted from 90 to 81%. There's an 81% probability I would make that move. As I get lower, if I hit 20 degrees, there's a 60% chance now I would take that move. At 10, there's a 36% chance I would take that move. At 1, or I'll just do 2, at 2, there's almost no chance I would take that move. So as this T value decreases, the likelihood of taking and doing bad moves decreases as well. And here's the algorithm to show exactly that, right? So again, if we're working through these things, this first little approach, since we're doing iterative searching or iterative optimization, I technically can run this forever is what I, you can think about, right? Because I could always just be improving slightly more if I design this out the right way. Uh, however, what I will tell you, this is, I know you're still, you know, Throwing down your code for problem set two A star. There we are. So, anyways, you'll get to do this one later. My point being is, well, hey, then what about T? Right? I just did. Let's make T go down by one at each iteration, each part of the for loop. Do I have to do that? Well, no, right? I could do some form of a, a slope, right? This, this whole just gradual, uh, what's the word? Uh, inverse logarithmic uh, decline, right? It never goes to zero, but it gets ever so closely to it. That's one approach. That's another approach. That's the linear just go down by one, right? Both of them work. The way I want you to think about it is, well, one's going to take longer because a steadier decline mm -hmm, versus a sharp, right? This one has the temperature going down very quickly, right? This one doesn't. 
slower declines will allow you to have more random in the beginning. That's, that's essentially, they'll allow for a little bit more randomness uh, to go on. More to my point, though, right, that I really care about is more this idea that eventually you decide whether or not you want it to be finished with your search. And how do you determine that, right? This algorithm, the pseudocode I'm giving you, right, this part I'm saying, does T have to explicitly hit zero? No, it could just be that it's some delta T, where t uh, delta T, oh, you know, the, the temperature is no longer decreasing at a significant rate, or I'm no longer making improvements anymore. So let's go ahead and just stop the algorithm, right, through some kind of delta T over some number, right? Temperature's no longer decreasing, it's kind of stabilized. Either way, the more important part, again, not, not so much the uh, when do we stop, but rather what do we do, right? Well, again, when we're making a consideration, and this is just more of a like repeating it because I've, I've met some of you, maybe you didn't, that didn't click, of like the random selection. You randomly pick a child, right? You randomly pick one of the children. You don't evaluate them. You do not try and make an assessment of which one is the best. Don't randomly, uh, randomly try and pick the best one. No, no, it is pure random. Math.random, right, you dot, you know, multiplied by four, and then you pick there, right? You have to pick one of them to be random because, again, the goal is calculate out the delta. It's not calculate the best and always guarantee a step up. No, that's hill climbing. Calculate out the delta. If it's a good move, yes, we absolutely make the change. If it is a bad move, we do that mathematical equation that I threw on the screen, right? The math, you do math.e, multiplied and all that stuff. You do the whole calculation. And then look at that. Look at that right there. Math.random. Okay, that's a zero to one uh, uh, value that you've generated. If it's lower than the probability you just calculated, congratulations. Take the move. Now you have no problems with problem set three, except for the fact that I haven't given it to you. So let's see this in action, right? Okay, fine, we, we, we have that same configuration. Arbitrarily, we pick one at random. I'm gonna randomly pick the third one to demonstrate now that, hey, this is a, clearly a better move, right? This was clearly a better move. I see the delta 21 minus uh, our 121 minus 106 produces a positive 15. 15 uh, uh, is bigger. Clearly, I take this move, right? Probability I accept this, one. Just automatically do it. But what about that other one, right? That, that, that negative or that, that worse move, that 93. Well, again, if we're doing the delta, right, we're doing our calculation, 93 minus 106 that's gonna produce a negative number because this is a worse move. But that doesn't mean we ignore it, it's we have a, a probability, right? E raised to the power of negative 13 over whatever that T value is. Remember, T changes depending on how early in the, your search. Making sense, good questions. Because you know what time it is. It's time for you to do a little calculation. I'll give you till uh, 950 or 350. 350. I strongly encourage you to make friends and divide and conquer. Just practice. And we are back. Let me see how you did. 
Da, da, da. Ha. Oh, who signed me out? Give me a second, carry the two. Who? Who is pretending to be me? There we are. All right, so let's hop on. There's all of y'all. That was the last class. Okay, so if we're looking at this, uh, for the most part, you know, we're doing decently. I don't know where you got your calculation from. Um, double check what you kind of did with that. Um, for the most part, you know, I, I do see some differences. Maybe that's a little too much, too much going on there. Remember, if we're thinking about swapping A and B only, if I'm only looking to make these swaps uh, in that situation for A and B, right, the only two that are swapping are B and Y. Everything else stays the same. That turns into, where are we, V? V is 19 plus 19 plus 18 plus 21 plus 27, right? And I'm going to take a stab in the dark here and prove it's 104 because I don't trust my own brain for that. 104. So that's mostly, again, you know, it's, it's maybe, you know, you went a little too quickly because, you know, I see the four at the end. That's fine. Again, just make sure you're kind of being mindful of it, especially since I do see you got the calculation quite right. Again, the big thing I will say with this is um, when it comes to, like, the midterms, four digits is fine. That's, I, I typically will have a little blurb there of like, hey, round to the you know, nearest thousands or something like that. Not, again, this is meant to just be practice for you to get familiar with things. Uh, so for the most part, looks like some of y'all get it. If you didn't, that's, again, double check, kind of work through the algorithm again uh, is the big thing there. Because, again, right, specifically if we're looking at that 114, right? Hmm. If I'm attempting to maximize and 114 is bigger than 111, then I do want to take that move. So that, that's always going to be a, a, a one in the probability perspective. I saw a hand up. Okay. No. No. Again, so it was the, I, I don't have it. So like uh, swapping A with B. A with C, A with D, A with E. Yes. Yeah, sure. So if we're looking at my delta E for specifically this one, right, uh, we want to look at next minus current. So 104 minus 111, right? That's going to produce a negative seven. Um, for the slides, or for the thing, I lied and told you temperature would be 30 instead. But if we're looking at that from the kind of perspective of here, so delta E negative seven, uh, T is going to equal 30. So math dot E raised to the power of delta E divided by T, and that's where we're getting that negative, or that, that that's 79%. Uh, percent. That. Cool. Mm -hmm. But I'll just keep on moving. Again, if you're, you know, by all means, work through these. This is what the, yes. You no, you just move on. You you uh, you say I didn't take my move this time. That's it. You yeah. Because what will happen? Well, if I don't take a move, the whole process starts over again. You know, temperature decreased 
but we just keep on doing the algorithm until we've cooled off. So, yeah, we just don't do anything. Uh huh. Now, just to shift gears for the sake of time, I, you know, I got plenty of time, but again, be mindful of simulated annealing. Now, I want to shift our approach, right? Simulated annealing, inspired by metallurgy, right? Heating up molecules, letting them become erratic. But that is only one thing that we see in nature, right? Not everything has to get super hot and then we dunk it in water, right? Other approaches, like the theory of evolution, survival of the fittest, right? Those with the best genes will survive, procreate, and move forward in life. The others will die off. And that's another approach that we can see as a metaheuristic, right? This is, uh, I don't even know how old this website is, but if you ever feel froggy and, you know, you're bored, you can visit this. No, no, ah, no, I don't. Look at crap. If you're ever feeling froggy, you can visit this website. And you can just watch as genetic algorithms uh, build cars. And look at them. They're not doing too good at the beginning, right? Survival of the fittest, right? What's getting the farthest? This seems to be making it quite well, and so it will be the procreator. It will be, uh, it's doing its best. Uh, 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 come on, hurry up and die. I'm sorry, I want to make a point. No, no, there you go, die, die, there you go. But look at all the children. Look at all the children. That one doesn't look at all like it. My Okay, I didn't, hey, welcome to the algorithm, right? Let me just fast forward. Surprise me. So uh, what's up with y'all? Ready to see what uh, 20 generations of car death look like? There you go. And look how far they go. Oh, look at that airtime. Like Vin Diesel and Fast and the Furious, except for there. My point being, if you're ever feeling froggy, I, I, I've, always, I've loved to just like r have this running and then go do an errand and come back in an hour. Why? Because yeah, it's hilarious. Because uh, you get to see what they do and kind of the limitation, uh, but that's distracting, so I'm going to keep on moving on. Again, what's the purpose? What's going on? What, what were we just like giggling over? Well, again, the way you could think about that design, right? If you have just a simple physics engine, a little simple 2D, you know, side scroller for you game developing uh, concentration students, right? Hey, it's just a gear moving and physics kicks in. And maybe that car has something like 10 chromosomes. Well, where are those 10 chromosomes? Well, hey, you know, that back wheel, it could have a radius, that's just a numerical value associated to it. The front wheel could also have a radius, that's also a numerical value. And then, hey, you know, since we're dealing with this kind of weird body that needs to make sure it survives and bounces and be able to kind of move about the environment, maybe, you know, your edges and your corners, the distance of each one of those line segments is just an arbitrary number as well. And what I've produced is 10 possible numbers that could be manipulated. Well, what do I mean by manipulated? Again, we randomly generate them or whatever to start. And that's going to produce some what we call in the genetic algorithm world population, right? Suddenly, hey, let's say I have five possible options, right? Hey, each one of them has their own set of uh, chromosomes, associated to them where you know which one does each one do okay yeah i don't who cares right that's a different problem altogether but again every one of my candidates the configuration right that we were looking at when we were talking about simulated annealing here it's we refer to it as the chromosomes in each one of the individual columns right each one of the options that's a gene 
No different than you and I. We have DNA. We've got genes, right? I have slacks. Okay, no, that was a bad joke. Fine. Funny to me, that's why I said it. My point being, again, I have these genes that I can uh, work off of. Um, and so what we end up doing is that same approach, right? Before, I was just adding them up. Okay, that's fine, but that's only like, you know, that's for a toy example. A lot of times, right, the, the evaluation has some real world, con real world context or it's something beyond just add up my numbers. Let's say arbitrarily, right, we're calculating, we're doing the car, right? Well, then we take all of our genes, we run it through a simulation. How far do you go? How far do you get in this simulation? And that's your performance measure, right? Suddenly, right, I've got A1 has a, a, a got to go 10, whatever 10 happens to be, 10 miles. Uh, A2 got 11 miles. A3 got 23 miles. A4 got 20 miles. A5 got 16 miles. Right, cool. Well, then what I have is at the end of the simulation, I have simulated everyone's moves or everyone's performance. And so the next question becomes, okay, who did the best job? And then we have effectively figured out from this population, from this generation, these are the top performers. These are survival of the fittest. They win. They get to be, you know, the persons, the, the agents that go on to make the next generation of agents, right? Now, this is where it all depends. How do you do your selection process, right? I showed you just top performers. And I, yes, the A4 should be at A3. Work with me here, right? But maybe instead you go, oh, top performer uh, and a random. Like, again, they're the top performer. They get the, you know, as survival of the fittest, as king uh, or queen of the jungle, they get to pick who they mate with, right? And so when two agents love each other very much, they make a crossover point. And that crossover point is now how we decide what the child's going to look like, right? Hey, we have our top performer. Hey, we have the top performer or the second top performer, right? So we have A3, A4. Okay, fine, right? Okay, they're top performers. They're going to make the next generation. So what do they do? Oh, well, in this case, I'm going to randomly select a crossover point, two. This is just an index, so we all can look at this and go, yeah, that's an index, right? I'm not blowing your minds there. Well, if you're less than two, you come from the left side. If you're greater than two, you come from the right side. And welcome to passing on the gene. Suddenly, boom, boom. I've created a new entity for the next generation that is a combination of my top performers. Oh, does it always have to be crossover two? No. Mathed out random, right? You decide. Again, how, does the, how do you design your children uh, from, from, you know, from your, your, your parents? You could do the crossover point. You could go through each one of these and do a coin flip, right? Mathed out random, 50% chance on all. Every one of those are valid, you know, are viable options that you could be working off of, right? I could make, I can even have twins, right? If I did math out random and I'm producing a thousand children, right? Probably going to get duplicates, right? But that's fine. We don't care about that. We're just trying to produce the next generation. That way we can evaluate them. If we have two that are the same, that's fine, right? This isn't real world. We can just... Have twins and they'll die together. <laughs> what? These aren't real. I can talk about these twins because look at them. They're not real. They're air quoted. They're dead to me already. <laughs> However, we can keep on going because, oh, well, you know, if I only have uh, a certain number of uh, genes to work off of, then I might, you know, get stuck in that same 
local maxima, right? Oh, now I hit a point where I can't improve any further. That is where, just like we have in biology, the concept of mutation. Hey, let's arbitrarily have one of your values change. You know, again, toss up. It, it's a genetic mutation. Why? Because it may push us forward, right? This is mutants, Deadpool, right? Deadpool did the mutant stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, X-Men and whatnot, right? There you go. You understand mutants. What am I talking about? I was born in the 90s. I wasn't even born in the 90s. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> My point being is, again, uh, other options that we could be working off of is this idea of the elite child. Well, again, if you were to go and watch that car website, you'd notice that one of them uh, or two of them always looked slightly different. And it's because, well, hey, again, since we're not real life, you know, let's produce our generations, but let's go ahead and keep those top performers. Because again, let's keep that notion that these are our best performing configurations. Let's maintain that observed configuration just in case our children aren't that good, right? Then in the next generation, right, if this is, if that elite child is still the, the best performer, I, they just keep on repopulating. They keep on being the best and they get to make the, the next generation. That's perfectly fine. It has its own pseudocode as well. You could take this for problem set three. I've seen students do both, or not, I've seen them do simulated or genetic, both work. Uh, but that same approach, loaded, notice, we can keep on going, right? Do I have to stop after a certain number of generations? No, humans haven't stopped. We just keep on going, in theory, until the, the, the whatever melts or evaporates, whatever. Uh, earthquake eats us all, right? We keep on going. We just keep on going forever. That part's perfectly fine. That same approach, just like we saw with simulated annealing, keeps, right? Do I just continue to optimize or do I have some good enough th threshold that I can work off of, right? Both of those kind of work. But more to my point is you can see where we kind of start is, hey, for each generation, for each iteration, I'm going to produce, I'm trying not to just use a lot of shun words, right? At each iteration, T, right, I'm going to produce an empty set. That's going to hold my population, right? Okay, well, let's build that population. Well, hey, based on our old population where everyone used to be, who do we pick? Who do we select from the last generation of people? And that's why, again, you can see it's a selection type. Do you go, you know, you obviously don't go random unless you're trying to just simulate normal uh, behavior, or you want to do top performers, or you want to, right, that part's, you know, whatever. Either way, you notice it's in its own for loop, right? Hey, how big do you want the populations to be? Okay. Fine, we'll run it that many times. We make the child. There's the reproduction cycle. You do the crossover point. Ken, you're going to be doing this multiple times over, right? So you, just, you can have to, whatever. Then you notice, hey, you do a math.random again, right? That you let chaos in. You let there be a little bit of controlled chaos. And if that math.random is less than your mutation rate, if we jumped back to this thing, I think it was on there, right? You'll notice. Mm -hmm. Right? Mutation rate, 5%. So even this little example that I was showing you had that same approach going on there. Well, that's 0 0.05, and if you generate a random number less than 0 0.05, you do some mutation. Whatever, you know, you have, your, have fun. You get to decide those types. Of, whatever happens, then you add it to your new population, right? You just add it to that new one, and you replace your population when you're done generating all your kids. And you do it again and again 
and again and again. Questions on that? Yes. Size, you know, the car thing. Uh, again, how many children do you want each um, iteration? So, same kind of thing. I think the the example works off. Does it have? It didn't explicitly. Where are? There you are. It doesn't explicitly say size, but it was generating, uh, I believe, twenty entities each round. The drop down under the five percent. Oh, what was the question? Oh, and for this case, uh, just you can change what you wanted it to be. What does it do, though? It's a random number, or it's a threshold to decide. Yeah, so again, yeah, well, I mean, you, you pick what you want it to be. It can be, uh, I'll just show it to you just for the sake of time. I don't have a lot. No, that's not what I wanted. I don't care. Carry the two, question life. We're hitting that, that point in time, right? It can be anything. It doesn't, that, that what is it actually? Uh, you pick. It's right there. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, I would have to sit down and read what they what it is. I didn't build this thing, so it probably you know. What's floor do? They added things in to make it fun and configurable, right? What what does mutation size do? Well, again, you know, if you want to play that game, it can be one gene or multiple genes. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, just to kind of show these, because I only have a little bit left, again, you can take the idea of the genetic uh, algorithms approach, and you could do it to the linear assignment problem, right? That's actually a perfectly uh, reasonable approach, because you're dealing with configurations. This is where, just to kind of add some flexibility, right, you can do other types of problems as well. What if there was some form of a, a synergy that was going on? So red and green work together, and so you got some kind of bonus out of that. Again, that's the evaluation, right? You sort of control what we're doing in these cases. Uh, or you can go into some really interesting kind of problems where maybe I don't have uh, everyone on staff, right? Maybe uh, some of you have worked in a restaurant, you're not always on call, you're not always there, right? So if you're thinking about this, this is a scheduling algorithm, right? Who's on schedule when suddenly? And I'm too using task, but you'll see uh, uh, in a few lectures, we, we do scheduling problems. The other final thing I'll kind of finish off with is, you know, if I'm, my toy examples aren't really doing it for you, uh, Dr. Asunciao uh, is here at NC State now, new hire, and what he was working on with his team is specifically in using the genetic algorithm approach to optimize program structure. So not if you're just software development, right, you're a software engineer, not game dev or uh, AI concentration, you're trying to think, where would I use this? Dr. Asunciao is literally doing it. Hey, you've got this giant legacy code base. Let's break it up into possible new configurations to optimize it. So look at all the different configurations. If you're curious, you can very much read through it. Or again, Dr. Asunciao is here. You can always just pick their brain. That's, you know, they're just doing research. But you want to get out of here. And I see I have 40 seconds, so I bid you adieu. See you on Wednesday.